Today's webinar is being presented by Dr. Dane Mosier. Dr. Mosier is a board-certified family physician, and like many people in the field, he began studying the treatment of autism after his son was diagnosed with the illness. Dr. Mosier was raised near Houston and has spent most of his life in Texas. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics from New Mexico State University, followed by several years working as a computer programmer in Austin and West Texas. In 1999, he changed careers, becoming the head brewer for an Austin-area microbrewery. He later decided to pursue his long-standing interest in the health sciences and committed himself to a career of helping others by obtaining his Doctorate of Osteopathic Medicine from the University of North Texas Health Science Center of Fort, Fort Worth. He completed a three-year family me medicine residency at East Tennessee State University in Kingsport, Tennessee a primary care training program in an area of the country that sees a wide variety of pathologies. The teaching hospital in Kingsport has one of the busiest emergency rooms in Tennessee. His training there included pediatric outpatient and inpatient care, as well as time in the pediatric ICU. Dr. Mosher's professional interests include osteopathic manipulative medicine, functional medicine, which focuses on the diagnosis and treatment of the root causes of chronic illness and urgent care medicine. Before we begin the presentation, please note that questions can be typed into your control panel throughout the presentation, and time permitting, they will be addressed at the end. Now please welcome Dr. Mosier. Thank you, Nisi, and welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about complementary and alternative medicine in regards to uh, autism. And uh, hopefully I will have time for questions at the end. It's a very uh, rich subject and I'm sure there are going to be plenty of questions. All right, so I'm going to start with uh, somewhat of definitions. Uh, defin this is a difficult uh, term to define. But in general, this is my understanding of um, what these things mean. Complementary medicine is uh, medicine that, you, that uh, may be considered alternative, but which is given um, in addition to standard treatments. And you know, commonly I think of yoga, massage, meditation. Um, these are commonly things that would be done, say, with um, treating cancer. And then there's alternative medicine, and I think that the difference there is when you say alternative medicine, that you're using that as your primary treatment in place of standard treatments. But generally, we're talking about the same treatments between alternative and complementary. How often are they used? Um, with kids on the spectrum, uh, there have been a few studies to, to try to estimate it. It's, it looks like it's um, pretty difficult to estimate because they've been wildly different numbers, but somewhere between 28 and 75 percent, um, possibly higher than that. Why is uh, a certain treatment considered to be alternative? Um, well, there's a few reasons, and this kind of goes back to the, the vagueness of the definition. Um, one thing could be considered alternative, even, even if it's supported by the evidence, but it's not yet incorporated into the standard of care. And this is really how new treatments come into being a part of the standard of care. At some point, they're initially not the standard of care, and then evidence starts to support them, and then they eventually get incorporated. So there's always a brief period for most treatments that are now considered standard, where at one time they were alternative. Uh, you could also define alternative as not being paid for by an insurance company. Um, then there are the alternative paradigms. These are uh, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine from India, and homeopathy. These are uh, complete uh, separate medical systems that are distinct from traditional Western medicine, uh, but they are considered to be alternative. And then uh, there are you know, anything that has not yet been tested or is not easily tested and therefore doesn't have a lot of evidence for it and is not being commonly used is going to be by default alternative. And this does include fraudulent treatments, which unfortunately do exist. So there's debate 
I think, good debate about the use of the uh, term alternative medicine because I think every doctor is using some amount of alternative medicine whether they realize it or not. There's a lot of uh, therapies out there that really don't have good evidence for them, but they're traditionally used. And um, if you define alternative by not supported by the evidence, then I think every doctor is using alternative medicine. But really, all we really care about as doctors and patients is does it work or not? And therefore, if it works, it should not be considered alternative medicine, in my opinion. Uh, there are a lot of extreme opinions about the term alternative medicine. There's, uh, there's some groups, people and groups out there who are very much against anything considered alternative medicine. Um, I think to a fault, they uh, are really ruling out a lot of potentially promising therapies um, unnecessarily. And then there's the opposite extreme. There's people who are um, so suspicious of traditional medicine that they uh, uh, refuse to consider anything tradi using traditional and they want to use only natural or alternative medicines. And I believe that uh, neither of those extreme viewpoints is the correct one. I think that you need to find a, uh, a middle ground to, to have best uh, outcomes for your patient. And you got to remember that there are a lot of studies yet to be done. Uh, there's not enough people, uh, time, or money to have studied everything we need to study. And so absence of evidence does not necessarily mean that something doesn't work. A lot of them just haven't been studied. Some of them, we're still trying to figure out how we can study them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So why would we consider an alternative? Why would we consider a, a treatment that's not accepted by the majority of doctors or the conventional medicine? Well, we, uh, one thing that you could consider is that uh, the things that are considered conventional may not uh, have as, as robust of evidence as uh, we are led to believe. There's something called publication bias. And publication bias is when studies are done and um, are not always published based on the results they get. And a, a classic example is um, looking at antidepressants. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine did this uh, review of uh, antidepressant studies, uh, and, and the website link here uh, is here for the, if you're interested in looking into that. And it was an interesting analysis because looking back at the studies that had been published on the effectiveness of antidepressants, they found that uh, over 90% of the uh, um, studies were positive in favor of uh, showing that antidepressants did work well against major depression. But um, when they went back to review the studies that were not published, they found that the majority of the ones that were not published showed uh, uh, no, uh, no effect of antidepressants. And when they incorporated those studies into the meta-analysis and they looked at all of them together, they found that only about 51% of the studies uh, showed positive results for antidepressants. So does that mean antidepressants are worthless? No, but they're not the slam dunk treatment that um, we were led to believe. And then other reasons to consider alternative medicine. Some diagnoses uh, just don't uh, have a good standard treatment plan. And pancreatic cancer is a, an extreme example that comes to my mind. Uh, if you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, uh, you, you have about a 5% chance of being alive five years from time of diagnosis. And so the, the, the temptation to look for another option is certainly high. And then there's uh, some standard treatments that have no evidence to support them. Uh, over-the-counter cough medicines, particularly dextromethorphan, uh, also Benadryl would be included in this, uh, have never been shown to be as effective as placebo for the control of cough. And so if you understand that, even though it's a standard, uh, standard therapy, you might look for an alternative like honey, for example. Other reasons people would consider alternatives um, 
Well, standard treatments may have um, high risk of, of adverse side effects that people don't want to go through. Some people are distrustful of the system in general, maybe due to bad experiences they've had. There may be philosophical or religious conflicts with the standard uh, treatment. Uh, a classic example of this would be um, someone who's a member of Jehovah's Witnesses who refuses to accept blood transfusions. And um, looking at the autism in particular, the interesting thing about autism is that it's defined by three, um, three diagnostic criteria, and, and it's uh, impairments in uh, communication, impairments in social interaction, and restricted interests or repetitive behaviors. And there's not a single FDA-approved uh, drug that's indicated for any of those three things. There are FDA approved drugs for uh, indicated for irritability in autism, but irritability is not a core feature of autism. It doesn't apply to everyone. So certainly uh, I think uh, people dealing with autism are tempted to look uh, at alternatives because there really aren't a lot of standard treatments available. So I wanted to talk about how do you go about evalu evaluating a treatment, um, alternative or not, any treatment, um, as to whether it might be a good one to try? First of all, look to see if there's any evidence for it. Uh, PubMed.gov is an um, amazing repository of information for uh, all medical studies and dental studies as well. And uh, you can, it's got an easy to use uh, search feature. And I'd encourage everyone to take a look at it at least once. You might uh, get addicted to it. Um, what are you looking for when you're look, looking up um, evidence? Well, you're looking for studies that um, are rel you know are pertinent to what you're researching, and preferably randomized controlled trials. These are placebo-controlled trials where neither the patient or the researchers know who's getting what. That's considered to be the strongest type of evidence. Be wary of um, an anecdote you heard from a friend or someone on the internet. And it's not that that anecdote is necessarily worthless, but um, it's, not, uh, it's not good evidence. I think that you can find a positive anecdote about just about any therapy you can think of. And so the fact that you can hear a good anecdote about a treatment doesn't necessarily mean anything. Let's say we look for evidence and we're really not finding much. Maybe it hasn't been studied yet. Maybe it's too new. Uh, so how else could you evaluate this? Well, is there a, a plausible biological mechanism by which this therapy could work? That if there is, that doesn't necessarily mean it will work, but at least it it gives you some in, in, inkling that, it, that it, it could. And so you can get information about this um, sometimes through animal studies, but animal studies are limited uh, because their biology is not exactly the same as ours. And then there's uh, what we call in vitro studies. Those are studies done on tissue in a, in a, um, in a lab apart from the human body. But you can, they, you can learn a lot about um, how cells react to various treatments based on what they do in a test tube. This is one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, probably a lot of people have seen this by now. You, you definitely don't want to uh, rely on a treatment that uh, says there's a miracle involved. So um, these are some general guidelines that I've come up with for evaluating treatment. I think this is um, certainly applicable to the autism community, but perhaps any of the alternative medicine uh, treatments. I, I think you should be wary of any product that's only sold through a multi-level multi -level marketing program or is only sold through one company. I think that uh, treatments that are uh, well vetted and established as being effective through the marketplace are going to be sold by multiple companies. Um, Multi-level marketing I think is a uh, suspicious marketing 
uh, uh, plan. I think that uh, any product that's truly worthwhile can probably be sold through the the uh, marketing uh, network that has been set up for the last thousand years in human history, and they don't need five levels of middle um, middlemen. That doesn't necessarily mean that products of multi-level marketing companies are worthless, because I, I, I don't believe that. But um, it does bother me that uh, they are sold through what I, I consider to be a, um, a, a, what's the word, a method that takes advantage of the newest distributors. The people who are just getting into selling are the ones really fin financing the company because they have to pay distribution fees to get it, to get started. And I'd also be wary of fads, and uh, fads are extremely common in the autism community. This has been going on for years now, and it's um, and this kind of goes along with don't look for the miracle. You know, one thing that I think is. Um, a real issue in autism is that we're still trying to um, figure out what the cause is, and we don't have any sort of uh, slam dunk cures. And so it's real tempting to try to find that newest thing that's going to finally solve this puzzle. And it never, well, at least up till till now, it has never worked out that way. There have been a lot of fads. People have jumped on and said, "Okay, now we know the, this is going. This is going to do it." And it never is quite as great as it might seem at first. So that doesn't mean you can't try something that that comes out and is a, a fad. But I, I would put it through all the criteria that I'm talking about right now, and uh, truly try to look at it objectively. Don't uh, don't think that you're going to find the one thing that's going to cure your, cure your child. Um, I, I believe the treatment of autism is a, is a marathon. It's, it's a cliche to say it, I think, now, but it really is true. It's not a sprint, and uh, you, you can get good results, but it does take time. Follow the money is generally uh, good advice for any uh, treatment, whether it's alternative or not. Who's making the money from this, and are they the ones that published all the research? And have their uh, results been verified by a third party. So when you're evaluating whether uh, to start a new treatment, you have to think what are, the, what are your goals of this therapy and how are you going to measure success. There's a lot of, uh, there's certainly a lot of supplements that uh, we can give our kids that might make us feel good for giving them, but then how do you know that you're really getting anywhere? with it if you can't measure something, measure a positive change. You have to evaluate what are the risks of any treatment. So you look at potential side effects. Um, you may be able to get some of this through your clinician. You may be able to find some of this through PubMed. You also need to consider how serious the side effects are and whether they are going to be temporary. In other words, will they go away when you stop the treatment or are some of them permanent? Um, there aren't too many that I could think of that would cause permanent side effects, but um, there certainly are some prescription drugs that come to mind that can cause permanent side effects, such as antipsychotic medications. What might be lost by not following a traditional approach? So that's um, you know if you're if you're choosing an alternative treatment in, in lieu of a, uh, a standard treatment that would normally be indicated. What might you lose by following this path? Uh, and then, what what is the financial cost? So I'm going to go. I'm going to use these uh, criteria to to evaluate some alternative therapies that we use in autism. Melatonin. Melatonin is a, a used as a sleep aid. It's actually one of the most uh, uh, robustly supported uh, interventions we make uh, according to the evidence. It's still considered an alternative uh, therapy, I believe. So is there evidence for it? Yes, there are. there's quite a bit of evidence now. We've got at least five randomized controlled trials out there showing benefits. 
and this uh, PubMed um, study that I linked to here is, uh, is a meta-analysis of those studies. What are the goals of the therapy with melatonin? Well, the main thing that it's been shown to do is to improve time to sleep onset. It, in some kids, does seem to improve sleep duration and quality. And then as a consequence to uh, a better sleep, we also see improved daytime behaviors. And then uh, this picture here that I included is one of the little side benefits of therapy as well, and that is the parents may get some sleep finally. So how will success be measured? Well, it's pretty easy to figure out how much time it takes for a child to get to sleep normally, and if it's dramatically different, then it's pretty apparent. Daytime behaviors is something that uh, could also be uh, monitored. So if, if the parent is not um, able to differentiate any differences, you may be able to get a, uh, a teacher or an ABA therapist to start giving you feedback uh, each day, like, hey, did you notice anything different today? An ABA therapist should be keeping hard data on behaviors as well, which provides a really concrete uh, feedback for this. What are the risks of melatonin? Well, bad dreams are a known side effect in some people. Those are sometimes uh, transient, and they may go away with time, but it certainly does happen for some people. Melatonin does have an effect on bowel transit time, and some people, I think, uh, more likely it's, it will, in, it'll, uh, speed up uh, the movement of the bowels. Um, I have seen uh, one case where it caused constipation as well. This is uh, fairly unusual, though, in my experience. And I put the pendants there with a question mark, and that is because right now I don't think there's any solid evidence to suggest that using melatonin on a regular basis leads to dependence on it. And that's a little uh, uh, um, paradoxical because most times when we give hormones to a uh, person on a chronic basis, the body does tend to start making less of it and uh, can lead to um, even a uh, atrophy of the gland that's making that hormone. But in melatonin, it does seem like the, uh, the, the uh, light, dark um, cycles of the day really do uh, are in charge of melatonin release from the uh, pineal gland. And as far as we can tell right now, there is no indication that taking it regularly will lead to dependence. I, you know, I think you have to realize, though, that uh, perhaps we don't know everything there is to know about uh, melatonin in the pineal gland, and th this information might change with time. Another risk of using melatonin as a sleep aid is uh, it could be that your child's not sleeping because uh, he or she is in pain, and this could be due to uh, GI uh, discomfort, constipation, inflammation, infection. Melatonin could be masking that. You, you could put them to sleep and think all is well and really you haven't really addressed a real problem. What might be lost by not following a traditional approach? Well, there's the traditional approach for a sleep issue with a child is, is um, not pharmaceutical or pharmacological. It's generally um, working on developing good sleep hygiene such as turning off TVs and electronic devices an hour before bed, um, making sure that they don't uh, spend time in bed um, playing, uh, that bed is, is strictly a, a place to go sleep. Um, these are things that I think most parents work on before they uh, think about trying melatonin, but it's good, always good to keep it in mind that you don't want to ignore these issues. And what's the financial cost of melatonin? Well, it's exceedingly cheap, eight cents per night for uh, a high quality brand that I recommend. Um, and I do think brand does matter. Um, there, ha there was a, an analysis of um, several brands of melatonin done in the past by Consumer Labs, which is an independent um, uh, lab that evaluates contents of of uh, supplements. 
they did find that not every supplement contained the amount that they said they did. So I think it's good to find a brand that is in independently verified for potency. Okay, well let's apply this uh, rationale to omega-3 fatty acids. So what do we know about them? They're known to be essential for brain development. They're useful in addressing inflammation. I apologize, I misspelled useful there. Is there evidence that could be used therapeutically? Yes, but uh, small studies. Um, not as robust, perhaps, as for melatonin. Uh, it is one of the more widely used nutritional supplements. And there's plenty of observational reports of improvement in socialization, hyperactivity, and self-stimulatory behavior. So uh, we're getting some um, anecdotal um, or case reports uh, of improvements. This is not hard evidence, but it, it's, it doesn't necessarily need to be ignored either. Treatment goals with omega-3s. Well, we're looking for general improvement in health and nutrition, reducing self-stimulatory behaviors, reducing hyperactivity, and increasing socialization. So we're getting at some of the core features of autism here, actually. And then it can help be helpful in reducing inflammation if that's an issue. How is success measured? Um, this is where a, uh, an EBA therapist is certainly helpful because they can collect objective data uh, each day on self-stimulatory behaviors, social skill initiations. What are the risks? Well, one of the risks is using a poor quality product because not every omega-3 supplement out there has been tested for heavy metal content or oxidation. And uh, you don't want to take rancid oils uh, or heavy metals because that's just going to make your issues worse. So you definitely want to stick to a, um, a high quality brand. You can get a uh, change in bowel frequency and consistency. Usually t things tend to get a little bit looser if you're doing a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. Sometimes it can cause an upset stomach in some people. And it does seem to uh, have a mild blood thinning effect. So um, generally if you're scheduled for a surgery, you're asked to stop your, uh, your fish oil or omega-3 supplements a few days beforehand. What might be lost if you don't if you uh, don't follow the traditional approach? Well, none here because there really is no traditional approach that we're comparing this to. Uh, this can be done in conjunction with other therapies without much problem. What does it cost? It's going to depend on the brand, but uh, looks like roughly a dollar a day. Okay, one last uh, therapy I wanted to talk about using these criteria, and that's dietary intervention. That's a broad term, but we're talking about um, basically improving the diet in a, in, a, in a general way, eliminating problem foods that may exist, and uh, increasing uh, the nutritive value of the foods. So is there evidence for this? Yes, uh, but it is limited. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is a slam dunk based on the evidence. Um, what are the goals of therapy? To address uh, nutritional deficiencies or if there's a problem with uh, maintaining a, a good uh, growth curve, you, uh, I think it's reasonable to consider this. It can improve sleep quality if a child's eating a problem food. Uh, sleep sometimes dramatically gets better when you eliminate that food. Improve daytime behaviors. Um, and this is this kind of goes back to some of the core features of autism, but it, uh, and also just irritability in general. And then if they're having GI symptoms, certainly we would expect to see improvements there. Skin rashes and headaches may get better if you eliminate um, foods that someone is allergic to as well. So how will success be measured? Well, here is, uh, uh, I mean, you can certainly um, just observe improvements at home and a lot of parents do tell uh, me that they saw obvious differences when they made a certain dietary change. But you can also follow this through laboratory testing, checking in particular for nutrient deficiencies, mineral deficiencies. You can also here again rely on a, a behavioral therapist to give you objective data. Uh, 
on how things are changing day to day. And then symptom resolution, are they uh, no longer having abdominal pain, no longer straining on the toilet, sleeping all night, for example. What are the risks? I think the risks are, are, are generally overstated. Some people say that putting a child on an overly restricted diet is a, uh, uh, puts them at risk nutritionally. But you know, if, you're, if you're being monitored or guided by a, uh, uh, someone who knows what they're doing, a, a clinical nutritionist, uh, a dietitian, or a physician, uh, there, should, there shouldn't be any risk of that because the, the whole goal is to improve nutrition in a scientific manner. What might be lost by not following the traditional approach? Well, the traditional approach, approach in this case is just to eat whatever you normally eat. And uh, what might be lost by not doing that? Well, if done well, there's nothing that's going to be lost because most of us need to eat a healthier diet. What does it cost? Well, it varies. It's uh, possible to do it with uh, a limited budget. And the reason for that is uh, because I think the reason it becomes expensive for some people, say they're trying to avoid gluten or, or dairy products, a lot of people will go out and buy replacements for their packaged foods with gluten-free and dairy-free versions. Well, those are always more expensive and uh, they're really not, it's really not a good idea. Processed food is just not the healthiest food, whether it's gluten-free or not. So we need to think about eating real food, not something that comes out of a plastic um, seal bag. So I wanted to go over a few other thoughts on uh, alternative medicine therapies uh, that didn't really fit into my categories that I set up here. Osteopathy. Osteopathy is a separate uh, medical system uh, that I know well because I am an osteopath. and. Um, I'm not going to go into the full history of osteopathy because I don't think that's really necessary in this uh, presentation. But uh, suffice it to say, DOs and MDs are very similarly trained. There is a slight difference in philosophy. The DOs believe that the body is capable of healing itself, that a doctor does not heal a person, and a medicine does not heal a person. They simply, the job of a doctor is to remove the barriers that prevent the person from healing themselves. And DOs are trained in, in uh, manipulative medicine as well. And so you know, we commonly think of how that's beneficial for someone who has back pain, but uh, it's actually used by uh, traditional osteopaths for all kinds of diagnoses, including asthma, pneumonia, bronchitis, um, gastrointestinal problems. Uh, any part of the body can be manipulated. So it's, uh, in my opinion, osteopathy is a little bit more comprehensive than chiropractic. No offense to any chiropractors that may be out there. I'm not against chiropractic, but osteopathy, there is a difference between the two. There are a lot of DOs who are working with children with autism. Uh, it's, it's becoming a, a, a growing uh, modality, particularly I'm thinking of uh, something called cranial therapy. Uh, I, I can't tell you that there's a lot of research for it. And this kind of goes back to something I said earlier in that there are some therapies out there that are either haven't been studied or we can't figure out how to study them. And cranial therapy is one of those things that it's really difficult to, des to design a randomized controlled trial for. Um, because sometimes the, the, uh, the cranial therapy just involves resting the someone's cranium in your hands and you're, and you're really not taking an active part in doing anything. You are monitoring their body as it treats itself. And I know that's a little esoteric, um, but um, th that, is, that is how it's commonly done and there are some really good results reported with this. So how do, you, how do you devise a sham treatment that you would use as a placebo in that case? Because just laying on the hands, in some cases, treats. And so osteopaths are still struggling to figure out how to come up with good evidence to support some of these therapies. I wanted to talk about homeopathy. Homeopathy was a separate uh, 
school of medicine in this country in the 19th century. Uh, they had uh, many homeopathic medical schools throughout the country, and they um, they all uh, shut down in the uh, early 20th century. Um, but classically trained homeopaths are still um, respected in Europe. The English royal family, from what I've heard, is uh, primarily uses homeopathic medicine. Uh, if you uh, decide to explore this, I would uh, try to find someone who's got uh, plenty of experience. And uh, if you understand what homeopathy is, you, you'll figure out there really uh, should not be any harm caused by trying it. And it's really fairly inexpensive. Um, the most expense is going to come in, in um, just paying for the time of the, of the experienced homeopath. But the remedies themselves are generally quite cheap. There are some anecdotal reports of symptom improvement. I am aware of some randomized control trials that have been done with homeopathy uh, that did show uh, uh, results better than placebo that were statistically significant. So I, I do think there is some actual evidence to support home homeopathy, but um, it's not a, I, I wouldn't say it's a robust evidence at this point. Essential oils and aromatherapy, these are uh, commonly used um, in all kinds of uh, conditions, not just autism. This is an anecdotal type of uh, therapy. Uh, chamomile, lavender, both have been used for calming. Eucalyptus has been helpful for congestion. Peppermint oils has been used for um, headaches. Um, if they're used appropriately, there shouldn't be any harm in using them, and the cost should be relatively inexpensive. I, I don't know of any research done for this with the autism community. And the evolution. This is basically showing how something goes from alternative medicine to standard medicine. And probiotics are a good example of this. A decade ago, probiotics were uh, not recognized. A lot of doctors didn't even know what they were or why you would take them. Uh, they were used by nutritionists, um, chiropractors, alternative medicine practitioners, and now they are widely prescribed by mainstream physicians, including infectious disease doctors who can't deny the, uh, the benefits and the, uh, especially in regards to um, preventing C. difficile infection in the hospital when using broad spectrum antibiotics. So this is now considered uh, a standard of care. One thing I wanted to address uh, is um, Ayurvedic medicines. Uh, this is a these are a, a folk medicine from India. There's also folk medicines from other parts of the world that um, have had this problem, and that is that they tend to be contaminated with uh, heavy metals. I'm not saying that every product uh, in these traditions is contaminated, but incorporating metals and, and uh, gems into the, into the remedy, at least in Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic uh, medicine, is, is considered to be standard. And uh, the FDA actually took a look at um, a random sampling of Ayurvedic medicines that were being sold online. And um, I believe they uh, tested over 200 different uh, remedies that they ordered at random, and 21% of them had measurable levels of lead, mercury, or arsenic. That's pretty pretty high. So you need to be real careful with using these kinds of medicines. Try to find uh, evidence that they've been tested for heavy metal content. I wouldn't necessarily take someone's word for it unless you can see an independent uh, assay. I wanted to, this, this is, I think, an extremely important slide. I'm going to go over each, each item here. Um, remember, when you're looking at a, a scientific uh, uh, trial for a treatment, that there's, you're not going to find any trials that show that something was effective for 100% of the subjects. We consider it a success if, it's, um, if it does better than placebo by a, uh, by a non-random, uh, with, with with a fairly low level of uh, chance of it being a random result. I mean, that's what's considered to be a significant study. So 
so instead of uh, with placebo, you're getting a response rate of 20%. You, with the medicine, you might get a response rate of 30%. And that, depending on how many people are in the study, that might be very significant. But still, you've got to consider only 30% of the people are responding to the medicine. So don't feel like just because evidence supports something that it's going to work for you or your child. Because uh, I think uh, it's probably safe to say that most things are not going to work for you or your child. And yeah, I think you need to be uh, ready to move on uh, and try something different if you discover something is not working. I think it's helpful to work in conjunction with a clinician to uh, help identify the treatments that do make sense for you or your child. I believe that uh, we're coming upon a new age in medicine where looking at um, DNA in a more detailed level, looking at specific uh, point mutations of the genome and uh, and then also being able to look specifically at uh, someone's biochemistry through an organic acids panel that we can really um, get a good idea ahead of time before you even start a therapy whether something is going to be helpful or not. And I, I believe that ability is going to increase more and more so we can get a real personalized level of medicine in the future. I don't think that's going to be possible to do by yourself at home. I, I do think you need to work with a clinician um, to help you with that. I would consider anecdotes uh, and advice from online sources um, with a grain of salt. I mean, they certainly can lead you to uh, looking into things. And, um, you know, a lot of anecdotes are certainly uh, encouraging, but uh, by themselves, not not good evidence. Consider the source of your information. This goes back to follow the money. Is the person providing you this information the one who's going to be taking your money for the treatment? Or can you find objective third-party data out there? Okay, and then let's, let's summarize here. Make sure you know the purpose of any intervention or treatment you're doing. Know its risks and benefits. Set up objective tracking measures. This is where ABA therapists can be sometimes helpful, or just uh, care providers and teachers may, can also been, help you here. Introduce new interventions methodically so you can track the results. That's uh, very um, important and sometimes hard to do because we get impatient and we want to try everything all at once. But if you do everything all at once, you're not going to know which is, which is helping or which is hurting if something good, really good or really bad happens. So it's really nice to introduce things at least every, every few days, one at a time. And ask questions. Ask questions of, of me at the end of this or ask questions of your uh, clinician. I thank you for your time. I think we've got uh, a few minutes here for questions. All right, let's see. Okay, well, let me just start at the beginning here. The question says, you point out that no autism remedy relieves the core symptoms. What do you think of the evidence that infectious fever does relieve core symptoms? And why do you think no one has ever studied this by MRS? Um, I'm assuming that's um, magnetic resonance. Well, that's a great that's a great question. I don't know that we um, I don't I don't know that I know the answers to that question. Uh, infectious fever does relieve uh, core symptoms in some kids, not all of them, but yeah, there are definitely um, some kids that seem to suddenly become normal when they have a fever. There's also reports of kids becoming normal even when they don't have a fever for just uh, kind of inexplicably for a day suddenly they're normal and then the next day they're kind of back to their um, autistic behaviors. Why has no one studied this? Well, 
I, you know, that's a really great uh, idea. Um, it would probably have to be done at a pretty large uh, academic center just to be able to get a population of kids who come up with fevers with symptom relief because I, I don't think this is going to happen all that often. But uh, I think it's a great idea. Next question is, um, what is the state of the research on the effectiveness of acupressure and acupuncture for ASD? Uh, I don't know of any evidence out there for it, for particularly for autistic um, spectrum. Now there is evidence for it um, in regards to pain relief, and although I don't necessarily believe that uh, that's the only a application for acupuncture or Chinese medicine. I think Chinese, you know, Chinese medicine has been around thousands of years, far longer than traditional medicine, and it serves as its, as its own self-sufficient uh, medical system in China. So I, I, I have the feeling that traditional Western medicine hasn't fully um, delved into the, um, the benefits of it. I, I know of some anecdotal reports among my patients where they saw some um, nice things uh, through acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Um, and the one that I'm thinking of, uh, my patient had a um, very limited diet and uh, after uh, Chinese medicine treatment, uh, suddenly his um, food repertoire dramatically expanded and he started putting on weight. Have there been studies on the usefulness of Ayurveda and mineral supplements for ASD? Ayurveda, I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. Not that I know of, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not out there. With mineral supplements, I believe that um, there's several studies out there, especially for magnesium, that have shown to be effective. Um, let's see. The magnesium is usually done in conjunction with the B6. That was um, the most popular studies that I've done. So it's kind of hard to, to uh, separate out what's doing what when you're giving two things at the same time. Um, but the combination of magnesium B6 have been shown to improve um, social interactions, communication, stereotypical behaviors, um, in, a, in, a, in a large percentage of children with uh, very few adverse side effects, if any. That doesn't work for everyone. That's for sure, and I can think of some uh, some cases, specifically certain enzyme mutations that someone might have, where you have to be really careful before you start high dose B6 with them. But um, I think magnesium is generally pretty safe. For omega-3 fatty acids, does the source, plant versus animal, play a role in its effectiveness? That's a that's a complicated question and a good question. I uh, and I think you know what this is referring to. Um, well, I I don't know that I can assume this, but there are there are omega three fatty acids that are obtained through fish oil, cold water fish, and then there's omega three fatty acids that are derived from algae um, and like marine algae, and this is uh, probably where the, the the cold water fish are getting their omega threes from. And these cold this this uh, marine algae is grown typically in a farm or a lab. And then there's um, the the more traditional plant based omega threes uh, found in flax seed, uh, walnuts, chia seeds, etc. And I can definitely make a statement about uh, uh, the longer chain omega-3 fatty acids found in fish versus the ones found in flax. I, I, I think that uh, you know getting uh, alpha linoleic acid from flax seed is not a bad thing, but your body doesn't convert it very efficiently to DHA or, or EPA, and I believe the DHA and EPA are, are essential for uh, good brain development and for the full benefits of omega-3s. So. 
Um, for those who um, are opposed to uh, eating fish, I think the uh, marine algae sources are um, are worth considering. Uh, their their biggest uh, problem is their cost. I think it's just a lot more expensive than just getting it from the fish. But um, as far as I know, it's the same DHA and EPA. So as long as you're getting the same doses, it should be just fine. I got a question here for dietary interventions. Could you elaborate on which interventions have shown benefits and which ones haven't? There are. Um, I, I would say there is some evidence, although it's probably fairly weak, for the gluten-free, casein-free diet. Uh, there's definitely some studies that show no effect, some that do show effect. Um, beyond that, the, uh, the SCD diet, uh, which is a specific carbohydrate diet, uh, is, uh, there's a study currently uh, being done here through the Johnson Center on, on that, and uh, I think that'll be a, a a very interesting study once it's published. So far we're seeing really good results with it. I think there's a lot of other diets that could also be helpful and I really think they need to be tailored to the patient. Not every patient is going to do well on SCD. Uh, not every patient needs to be gluten free or casein free. Um, those are clinical decisions. Uh, you can certainly undertake those at home um, and there, there might be relatively little risk of trying them for a while just to see what happens, but um, I would recommend you do that through, uh, th with the help of a clinician because uh, it might be obvious to a clinician which diet is really more appropriate. How can we select a good experienced homeopath? Hmm. Well, I think word of mouth actually comes into play here. And you can get word of mouth through people you don't know. Um, Amy Lansky has written a popular book uh, about uh, how homeopathy uh, recovered her son with autism. And uh, I think she has um, in her resource section in the back of that book a list of uh, homeopaths that she considered to be uh, high quality. And that's probably where I would start. Do you think HBOD is worth expense? We saw a lot of improvements in affect and social skills when we did 120 treatments. Um, I think if you saw a lot of improvements with it, then it probably was worth the expense. I think the problem with HBOD is that the evidence is, is um, not real robust for it. Some people definitely do report good results. The, um, I think the, the real problem with it is the expense. Uh, if you don't, you know, buying your own chamber is not cheap, and renting one is probably even more expensive if you're going to do it in the long run. And the the difficulty is that you um, you really have to do a number of dives before you can, you know, say one way or the other whether it's helpful for your child. And uh, so it's quite a quite an investment just to see if it works and there's a lot of people for whom it does not work. So um, it's not one that I usually recommend as like my go-to thing to try, but um, if someone says that it's helped their child, then I'm not going to argue with that. What do you think about the vegetarian or vegan diet for children with autism spectrum disorder? Um, I think it's challenging. And I, and I say that as primarily a vegetarian uh, myself. But I really think you need to look at, um, make sure you're getting enough uh, B12, enough um, formed of vitamin A, and enough um, omega-3 fatty acids. Because then in that diet, you're really uh, at risk for deficiencies there. I also, th I also worry about um, a child who's got a lot of gut issues, perhaps um, dysbiosis with yeast or some problematic bacteria, and um, going on a uh, lower carbohydrate diet can really be beneficial for those kids. And that's challenging to do on a vegetarian diet. Even beans 
which are considered to be uh, you know, the source of protein for vegetarians are still mostly, mostly carbohydrates. So I'm not, I, I don't think it can't be done, but it is challenging. All right, let's see. Let me look and see what else we have here. Where can we check the quality of the supplements? This is, uh, this is something that you can do by just asking the company directly. And what I would ask for, and this is what we do here at the Johnson Center before we recommend or, or stock a supplement in our, in our supplement closet, uh, we ask for independent uh, verification of the, of the contents and the purity. I think a high quality supplement company will do that. And then there, there's most supplement companies, however, don't do that. They might just do internal checks. Uh, and although that doesn't necessarily mean they're bad, um, I just don't trust them as much. So that's, uh, that's uh, how I would check. Does Dr. Moser use aromatherapy frequently? Uh, I don't, actually. I don't know. I know almost nothing about aromatherapy, um, unfortunately. I think it's not a bad thing to do. One thing I, I have done is use peppermint oil for uh, headaches. Um, you, can, you can apply peppermint oil uh, directly to the forehead uh, if you've got a tension headache. And uh, it can be helpful. You just have to be very careful that it doesn't go in your eyes. So you don't want to slather it on. You want to put a very thin amount on there. Beyond that, uh, I, have, I don't have much experience with it. Um, here's, I got two more questions. Oh, no more? No. Okay, I've been told, I'm sorry, I've been told no more questions. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a real pleasure, and I uh, hope you learned something, and I uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.